Hello, everyone. Welcome to HP Connects. This is our sixth week uh, going live. Today we have Doug Reed. Of He's the CEO and president of Meridian Associates. Doug, thanks so much for joining us. I'm really excited. Everyone, if you don't know Doug Reed, he is a, a powerhouse when it comes to turning companies around. That's, that's uh, my opinion, of course, uh, but um, I value my opinion. <laughs> Hello, everybody. How are we doing today in our most likely work at home office? <laughs> are we having fun? Or are we feeling kind of lonely <laughs> doing uh, Zoom calls all day long, as I have been? So I've uh, just been at Meridian just for a few months now, and I uh, had the honor of starting there right after the work at home. So I went to the office for two weeks, and it was mostly just me. So uh, we're looking forward to slowly getting back to work which is what all of you I think are contemplating right now as well. So we're just going to talk about, as you said, technology uh, and change in our constructed world. And of course, uh, this is even more uh, relevant now. Uh, the word change is, is so much more re relevant than we ever thought it could be. So uh, for agenda today is we're going to talk about how business evolves and how we can get stuck in a trap and I'm gonna talk about some ways that we can analyze that. And I'll also go through some of the technology. One fundamental thought I have, and it's really behind this book, the only promo here of my book, which is about strategy execution. We spend a lot of time developing strategy or thinking about strategy. What do we need to do next to position ourselves, whether it's our career or our business or our personal life, but it's actually implementing it that's really hard. And that's what this book is about. And as uh, Anastasia said, uh, you know, I'm really all about, you know, she used the term turnaround business, but I like to say that we like to execute the strategy so it's effectively. And so that everybody enjoys the outcome or the intended outcome of what we're trying to do. So this is a chart here uh, called uh, the speed of change. It's sort of a cartoon, there's no data behind it, but if you look at the bottom left, it goes way back to stone age days and uh, evolves to the days of the printing press and the steam engine. The steam engine, of course, in the engine, in the engineering world, just really exploded industry uh, and exploded the market for services where all of a sudden now we had a uh, machine, steam engine, which then could be put in a number of devices like, uh, like uh, a train and other things. And it would uh, allow us to sell our goods instead of just locally all across the country. And then we saw communications through telegraph, airplanes, and so on, up until mobile technology. And then a lot has happened even since this chart here has, uh, has ended. And uh, so this is, we've been sort of used to a lifetime of feeling like things are changing fast, but did we really expect them to be changing as fast as they are now? So let's take a look. Well, this is our offices, what, two, three months ago, pretty robust. Look at the uh, social distancing going on with the gentleman leaning over the woman who's working at our workstation and thought, well, this, this won't change. Something like COVID could never happen. Now we look at our offices now. There you go. So are there any doubters that change can't be even more rapid? In a blink of an eye, almost, this is what our offices have become. This is what our hotels have become. This is what our shopping malls have become. This is what a lot of things have become. Uh, this sort of empty feeling as people working remote and, and socially isolating, trying to stay safe. So, but then now all of us are also thinking about right now, what is the future gonna be? So there are some of us that are thinking, how can I just survive this? You know, economically, personally, my business may have, my business may have dropped off a cliff. Uh, and, and so we're wondering like, how do we just survive this? But then we're also at the same time saying, well, we really need to think about how we're gonna evolve from this. We don't have the luxury of the millennial to evolve our business based on change, even though it seemed like it was rapid, it's even more, it's more upon us and it's more urgent than we've ever felt in our life. So with this, empty office, we start thinking about, okay, if we're going to continue thriving in our business environment, but what do we need to do differently? Because what might our office, and this is an example, look like in the future? 
is it going to look like this, the same as it is right now? That would be pretty scary. Although surveys have shown that a lot of people actually like working at home. At our company, about 80% of the employees said they're perfectly happy working at home. If they never have to come back to the office, it's fine. We are engineers uh, and surveyors. So there is a, a group that says, you know, I just have to be near a plotter. I just need to be able to do a two foot by three foot drawing and be able to look at it on a table. I really can't do that at home and just looking at it on my screen. So there are limitations. As all of you know, there's some sort of limitations with you trying to do your business from home. So this is a picture of assembly row I borrowed because some clues about what our business might evolve are probably already around us. Things we've already seen changing and maybe even evolving fairly quickly. And so as we look at whatever it is our core business in this picture of this mixed use development in front of us now is whatever our particular instance is, look for clues that might suggest how we might position ourselves. This is just personally, I think, this is a trend that's been going on for a long time. Assembly Row in Somerville is pretty new. Dead in Place has been around a really long time. Same thing in Natick. And it's been a few years that up my way, north of Boston, that with the Linfield Marketplace has been there. They're all mixed use facilities. A mall I drove by for years and years, a Hanover Mall is being torn down now and rebuilt. So we see that happening right now. And you can imagine in the future environment, if you lived in an apartment, a condominium in that high rise and your offices was down here below and the retail stores you went down below, you could work at home. You could go to the office for a couple hours or not. In this case, there's public transportation nearby, so you could get on a subway, but maybe people aren't really going to want to get on buses and trains and subways anymore. So this is a represents maybe a picture that if we've got an empty office right now, a big office building, maybe, maybe we're going to be contemplating converting part of that to apartments, some of the condominiums, and some of it to retail space. That could be uh, one example of how we adapt our business in the new normal, uh, which is the newest buzzword. Uh, so this is an example here of uh, a trend that may take hold that we have seen in the past. So it may not, may the, the answer to what your future is going to be like may be already in clues a bit when, about trends that just simply fit the new normal. Now, I also uh, often talk about technology uh, regarding, and I refer to them as shiny objects. And it's partly because, maybe because I'm an engineer, that I find gadgets kind of interesting. Uh, I don't yet own the, uh, the uh, smartwatch. Uh, I have been thinking about it, but I haven't decided whether it's actually useful and productive or it's just a shiny object that's cool, uh, but not really providing a lot of function for me. In the middle, we have a 3D printer. A lot of printers, you know, at first we're just sort of gamey. We're making uh, little toys, right? You go to the trade show, go to ABX. The last few years, and some in the beginning, it was just kind of toy like things. But now we start seeing really serious things being built through 3D printing. So that's a technology that's come along that is still got a long ways to go. And I have my Amazon Alexa on the right. She's kind of a shiny object, kind of convenient, tells me the weather every morning, but I can get that on my smartphone too. She'll tell me the Red Sox score, although no point in doing that right now, right? So uh, maybe maybe by the fall we'll have some NFL. So so these are some things that are shiny objects. And so when we think about incorporating technology into our business, we don't want them to just be shiny objects, just something neat and a toy-like thing. We want them to actually help drive our business. So so as we evolve from the the, the, the COVID recession, uh, which we all hope will be quick. Uh, but either way, it's going to be severe and it's going to be painful. So how might technology play a role in the built environment? So let's uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, here's what the future could be. In that example of uh, Assembly Row, this person could be in their office talking to people distributed around. It could be that she's up in her condo talking to people down in the office or other locations. We could see that those locations might be satellite office, offices where this firm might have had an enormous downtown office, but now it's moved to a smaller office with maybe not just one or two suburban offices, but maybe 10 or 20 spread out in a few hour radius around Boston. And what does that mean for the built environment? That changes the use of facilities, maybe expands them some other, 
in other areas so that people maybe don't need to get on the highway and commute, don't need to get on the commuter rail or the subway to get to work. They can work at home or to go to a nearby office. But technology is what enables this. And we've been using video conferencing system and Wi-Fi and laptops and things like that for a long time. But of course, we're just seeing uh, such an acceleration of that where I would say there's hardly anybody, uh, anybody in this in the world maybe, or at least the developed world, who hasn't had a Zoom meeting over the last couple of months. Right. But we couldn't do it. Imagine if we were going through this COVID crisis and we didn't have this technology, laptops and internet and Zoom and video conferencing, it'd be pretty tough. Um, just to interject, so, it looks like we, I got a private message, a question. Do you wanna okay. wait? Okay, go ahead. Um, this person's asking, what do you think is currently the most useful technology that can be adapted for business use? Well, right now we're already seeing Zoom, yep. for instance, I think is, is the most probably useful at the moment. Uh, it depends on what your business is. I think that recognizing uh, that your customer is going to access your, your, your business differently is very important. Uh, and that certainly the movement towards online purchases has been accelerated and could very well endure. I also think that technology, having to co communicating consumers with business, for instance, on ordering supplies, buying food, the things we are experiencing right now, I think it's going to be, it's gonna stick around. I mean, personally in my household, I mean, it was a few years ago, we had fun with HelloFresh and uh, Blue Apron for a little while. And then we discontinued it, said, okay, we just like going out to restaurants. But, but now we've been doing HelloFresh for, for two months. And we're pretty used to having very good cook at home meals. We're used to calling in orders to restaurants and going and picking them up. So I think technologies that are communicating clients to uh, businesses will be important. And then getting that delivery to, to, the, uh, to the consumer, whether it be by drone. No, I don't really think it'll be so drone-like, but it would be uh, through courier uh, sure. pickups, things like that. So I, I think that's uh, going to be a key to many of our businesses. So with this uh, picture right here, this is one of Meridian Associates uh, drones. And uh, that's what the, uh, in, the, in the, the big image in the, in the middle of your screen, but hanging from that is a device called LIDAR, uh, which is a combination laser and radar uh, device. And it's a vehicle mounted one you can see in the bottom right hand side there. So this for me, who's been around for a long time, is such an explosion uh, in terms of technological advancements in the area of surveying, where when I took survey and it was actually, you had a transit, it was uh, basically a telescope, with a lot of numbers on it and you look through it and, you, and to measure something, you pull the cloth tape and you know, that, that's kind of dating myself, but that's reality. Uh, so nowadays everything's done digitally, but, in, but really is what accelerated things is this devices. They're in huge demand. I think we, can, we can't even keep up with orders in this area where people can remotely access by a vehicle on the right or by air, a very large area, be a forest where we're doing the inventory of the trees. We can sense with this device, pick up very accurate level, what's going on in the ground and pick up topography. We can pick up the trees, we can classify the trees. We can also go into a building and around a building. We can drive down a street and get to centimeter accuracy very quickly massive amounts of data, which we can use in so many different ways. For instance, in the early days of drones, it was mostly we were taking pretty pictures. But now we're actually, we're, 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 we're capturing the data that is the basis for planning, placing basis for design. It's used to manage, to plan and manage construction. And for large facility owners, you have multiple campuses, let's say hotels, uh, large colleges, and universities, uh, in, in industries that have facilities all around the world can use this data to help manage their facilities, for instance. So this is, uh, this is information that goes beyond survey. The well, survey tended to end at the, at the end of uh, construction, but this actually now, this allows you to use data in so many different ways. So remote sensing, I think, is, is huge and uh, will continue being so. This is an image taken from uh, the drone. Uh, of a downtown area. And it's very granular because it's just representing that every, every little pixel on there is a data point uh, that's picking up in three dimensions 
what's going on. And the software, some of the software platforms can even recognize that they're looking at a car, even looking at a door, looking at a window, looking at a door knob, even manholes and things like that. It can automatically recognize that. And it's very powerful. Now here in the bottom right is actually an interior shot uh, of some piping and it looks like a generator. And, uh, and so it's taking down to this very accurate picture of what's in that building. Whereas years ago, I know when I had a project like this, we would send a team out with cloth tapes and cameras and measure every little thing and uh, mark up the as-built drawings if there were some and then recreate them in the office. But now we just go out and scan it and with some uh, data manipulation, we end up with design plans, for instance. So I think this is, again, another reason why that's such a uh, important tool. Because we have that big data available to us, we can start doing a lot with virtual reality. And uh, this is a picture here in the bottom left of somebody holding plans in a, in a building that's under construction. And we see that uh, in images of the HVAC, HVAC system in the ceiling. So the virtual part is the HVAC system. They're able to see what's planned, what the design is so far. So that might be an engineer working on the design. It could be the contractor who's visualizing visualizing the system in place. He can know uh, and even show this to a client. Uh, I think on the right side, we see someone at the office looking at the same thing on his screen. And I have also been involved with projects where, for instance, a courthouse down south where to, to build a new Supreme Court, new Superior Court that was, uh, they actually made a, a courtroom out of plywood, did the design in virtual in VR, had the judges don those headsets and walk in the room. And then what they saw was a finished courtroom and they could actually put their hands on the tables, put their hands on the chairs, even walk over to where the light switch was on the wall and give the architect feedback as to what was happening. So just a lot of things going on with virtual reality that's uh, really exciting. So um, that's just uh, uh, tip of the iceberg about what we can do. Partly because now we have that big data which can be collected through those LIDAR systems. So now we have that, we can start then connecting all this data. And artificial intelligence allows us to do uh, things such as reasoning, uh, algorithms, and connecting devices. There are literally billions of connected devices in the world now. And this is depicting, you see the city in the back and some little clouds with, with symbols in them all connected together. We have Wi-Fi, we have the cloud, we have buildings, we have industries there, solar panels, roads, cars, bridges, uh, satellites everything that can be interconnected and can work together to then be able to make decisions based on the data to manage our life more effectively. So the connected IoT internet of things, that's what IoT stands for, is another important part of technology that will continue. Now, uh, I had this slide uh, in a presentation last year before I was thinking of COVID, of course, but imagine you don't have to worry about social socially isolating if you actually have a road, robot that's building the masonry wall. But this is taking the data from that original um, data collection through the design phase, programming into the device, which is then picking up the bricks and uh, applying the mortar and applying the bricks. So there's obviously a whole new world to support this kind of system, a new job, new careers, new businesses to support this kind of automation. So this is robotic pro process automation. That's what RPA stands for. Another thing that um, is out there, we hear a lot in terms of new technology is blockchain. And we really, blockchain, we usually hear about in terms of Bitcoin, which is money that floats all around the internet uh, from, and it's in a secure mode because it's so distributed and it's able to um, be, be tracked, managed, quality uh, taken care of and transactions can occur. But that's, that's a financial transaction using distributed uh, data management but it could be used for many other things. And the food industry is starting to use this to manage their inventory or product from the farm right to the restaurant. So there's a, that's been going on for a few years now and a group of food industry uh, companies have gotten together to help work through that to see if that's going to be a long-term solution to help them manage that uh, food supply. So that's an example of blockchain and big data management. And I think there's a lot more that uh, will be figured out and uh, invented in the area of how we might use distributed data. 
uh, when I mentioned the how we do design, we start with the LIDAR, we then do the design, perhaps using VR, perhaps not, then we build the facility, and then we manage all that information. If you can imagine from a facility owner, if everybody was involved with your facility, right down to the people who are cleaning your offices every week, to doing maintenance, to doing upgrades, all has all the history of everything available at their fingertips through this kind of distributed control, and everybody can upload to it and download to it, who has the authorization to do that? So it becomes quite interesting uh, what might happen. This is an example I call of, uh, of innovation and uh, innovation that disrupts. And it, the rule in the world of innovation is those who adapt win. This is a chart I, I use to show this example of the taxi industry versus Uber and Lyft. So this start, chart starts back when Uber first went into business with Lyft following that a little, little bit later. So it looks about 2015 or so. And we saw the number of New York City daily trips. Uh, and we see that the uh, taxis back then were about 500,000 trips per day. And currently through the end of uh, 2019, that had been knocked down to just under 300,000 trips per day. So certainly the incumbent, which is the taxi industry, which could be us and all of our businesses. We could be the incumbents in our, in our active business. Uh, and there might be someone that's gonna come along who adapts more quickly and it might hurt our business. Hopefully not put us out of business. In this case, we know taxis are still there, but maybe not as robust as they were before. What I think is interesting about the Uber line and the Lyft line you see, the dramatic increase, is that if one adds together the, tr the trips per day for Lyft and Uber, it looks about 150,000 and let's say 450,000. So we're now, we're now at a number that's bigger than, than what taxis were by themselves. So those two actually did create a new market, uh, new demand for that product, which was uh, transportation, individual transportation systems. So the net is a dramatic, dramatic increase in, an, in the business opportunities for all for at least Lyft and Uber, they created market that taxis didn't have available to them. So this is the, uh, the who, those who adapt win. Now, I also like to talk a little bit about this gentleman. He was one of my favorite business uh, professionals and I've been following him for about a decade. And this is Clayton Christensen. Unfortunately, he passed away last year, early last year, I think. And uh, he's a Harvard business professor who is considered by many to be the number one uh, management thinker on the planet. He advised his presidents, not just in the United States, but all around the world, published many books, and he was an in-demand keynote speaker in addition to his, his uh, day job at Harvard University. But he had these three definitions for uh, innovation, which I really like. He, I heard, a, heard him present, actually, uh, not just heard, I attended a live streamed event for, put on by Harvard Business Review, and he was the, the speaker and there were about 40 of us in the room, so I did have a chance to meet him. But I became enamored with his definitions here for these three different kinds of innovation. And the reason I talk about these is because we think about innovation, uh, you know, if we just think about it quickly, we'll think innovation is good. But then we think harder and we look at his definitions and we see that not all innovations are good for business. Not all innovation will drive our revenue, drive our margins, allow us to, uh, you know, to grow our shareholder value and allow to, us to provide career development opportunities for our employees. So disruptive innovation is like the Lyft and Uber where they created a new market. So disruptive innovation is one that changes things sufficiently, creates market demand, and the number of jobs in that area skyrockets. So the number of jobs in that particular area skyrocket because of that innovation. Now, Sustaining innovation is one where we come up with a new product that replaces the old. So every time iPhone, Apple comes up with a new iPhone, it makes the older iPhones obsolete. Obsolete. It doesn't necessarily drive their growth. It just allows them to keep up with the competition. So we do the same thing. We adopt uh, uh, innovations that simply allow us to stay on top of our competitors. Now, all those devices I showed you earlier, the firms that are using those robustly might be in the area of the disruptive innovation, but it depends on how easy others can enter those markets when it might turn out that they're a little bit more sustaining or at least they'll become sustaining 
at some point, once, once everybody starts using those tools, it won't be a differentiator. But efficiency innovation is the one that Clayton says is the most dangerous because we do like to be efficient. We will adopt efficiency tools, but efficiency usually means lower margins, lower fees, lower prices and things like that. So efficiencies tend to actually eliminate jobs, not sustain those jobs and not create new, new jobs. So we have to keep that in mind when we're pondering how are we gonna come out of this COVID crisis and the recession that's upon us. Think about, okay, as we adopt new ideas, not just technology ideas, but any new ideas, think about them these three ways because you really wanna to try to focus on, the, on A and maybe B will be there too. And you need to be very wary that as you adopt innovations in, in item C, you will need to have offset any revenue declines with A and B. Well, so A and B offsets C. So I've just talked about technology and I just talked about, and I will talk about massive cultural change right now. Very quickly, this is a list of some of the cultural change that have happened. The whole environmental revolution, the awareness of uh, air pollution, water pollution, land pollution, uh, health, uh, crops, uh, chemicals, uh, artificial additives, the foods, all those kinds of things as we're driven by this environmental revolution that is part science, maybe originally it was science driven, science that showed we might get cancer if we consumed a certain product, but uh, it became more than that. It became a societal thing, uh, it became a preference, it became a passion, it became an emotion. So I think right now we've been, for the last few years, we've, there's a lot of emotions behind environmental revolution. Communications also changed the way, we all know communications, how that's changed our daily lives. Global supply chains, well, we've had a few bumps in that over the last few years, but I think we're gonna return to you know, uh, more free markets than we've had in the last few years, and uh, global supply chains will always be there. And it's, it's, it's expected, it's just part of our culture. Uh, and then easy access to data, I mentioned the blockchain is one way, but we just have it at our fingertips on our phone, or if we have a smartwatch, we've got it right on our wrist. So data is very accessible. And computers everywhere, and then uh, the COVID. I threw that COVID down in red, because we haven't really figured out exactly what the enduring culture change is due to COVID, other than, as I mentioned, I probably will, will um, order out food more often, um, have it on my deck. I mean, everybody's using their backyard more than they were a couple months ago because now it's nicer outside and we're tired of being locked up inside our house. But now we're, doing, we're, we're starting to do things in our backyard. And so, you know, getting takeout and having dinner on the, in the, on the, on the deck, on the patio is uh, becoming, is, is very, you know, I like doing it, so I'm probably going to keep doing it. So there's a lot of, lot of change. You know, will people ever fly the way they did before? Will they ever get on a public transportation like they did before? Will they ever go and sit, you know, at a Bruins game like they did before? Uh, which, you know, some of you may have noticed in the last couple of years, they, the, 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 the seats have been densified in, in the TD Garden. And I did experience that uh, before the uh, hockey season shut down. So uh, I think that some, uh, offices that have densified uh, cubicles, for instance, and I know some very large companies that have done that in the last few years, shrunk the amount of space available to each employee. Well, you're probably going to be ripping that out and, and, uh, and, and doing the opposite, spreading people out. So these are things that are probably going to endure as much as cultural as health related. So with all we're talking about here is that we can overcome our vulnerabilities. The change we now know can be profound. That entities like the Lyft and Ubers just might move into our area. I don't mean them uh, exactly, I mean figuratively. Um, always be aware of who is out there that might move into our space. And then we must and can and must influence our destiny. And there are processes that we can use to prepare for that. And the comment on the processes is, is make it clear that it's probably taking a look at whatever our core services are, breaking it down to the exact skill that our employees have and our product down to detail level and thinking how we might modify these to, to emerge from this uh, crisis upon us now to be stronger than ever. 
So it's not easy to do this, but if we, if we do just focus on what we do best, that's likely, and look at what the trends have been going on before all of this happened, there's clues in that. So this is instead of like saying, we're gonna just do a completely new thing, new markets, new services, new everything, new locations, is generally not as, as much of a good idea uh, because it's so risky to do that. So, so it's probably an evolution that we'll need to get a hold of pretty quickly. So the question we're asking us, will be asking us once we get beyond this crisis a little bit, is who, who's going to be our Uber? So thank you. Any questions? doesn't look like me. Have any and this is my contact information too by the way so yeah did you mention what foster growth was it says yeah no i want to mention that um go ahead and type in your questions anastasia and sarah i'm monitoring that if there are any questions at all throw them my way we can use this uh the time we have remaining to answer them meanwhile i'll go over a few things on here besides obviously my email address Reading Associates website. My 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 Twitter handle is at Foster Growth, and really is related to a business consulting practice I've had for the last decade. And then I put down an interesting source for information for each of you. It's uh, www.ecl.usa.org. What that stands for is Engineering Change Lab USA. It's a nonprofit group that started up in 2017, founded by a group of engineers not just my kind of engineer the civil engineer but it was all kinds of engineers and uh, its purpose was to be a catalyst for change for the industry the industry that that typically doesn't have a lot of r d money set aside we don't have r d departments in architectural engineering firms but it has devolved to where there's now a number of of, uh, of engineer of universities involved we have software companies autodesk is involved ibm is involved we have utilities, electric utilities involved, and all different kinds of engineers from mechanical, electrical, and, and nuclear engineers all involved. They're looking at pondering the impacts of technology, social change, government change, uh, all of those things on, on the built environment and what it means, what do we adapt, what is our methodology. So if you do take a look at this web page, uh, it's just um, come up with version two just a few months ago. And it's quite robust now and it has a lot of information available to you. We've had eight summits so far since 2017 and there's a summit report for each. You might want to peruse. Um, some real powerhouses in, uh, in, the, in the world who are the real um, thought leaders on, uh, on technology and engineering and, and that I, I didn't mention the AIA is actually participating in it as well. So uh, there's some, there's some uh, all the full content of their slides and their white papers are all there too, available to you. And uh, we, um, we're having our ninth summit in um, next month. Unfortunately, it was, uh, it's not gonna be live, like there's nothing live happening right now. So it was gonna be in Boulder, Colorado, which I'm disappointed we're not gonna be there, but it will be a virtual event. So, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, and if you want to share that information uh, with our readers, I, I'm happy to share that on our social media, Doug, so. Okay, good, I would, uh, I will do that. And uh, I think all of you will find that uh, an interesting source of information as you ponder, you know, how your particular business will be emerging from, from uh, what's upon us right now. Looks like we have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, um, Regarding office design, do you think that offices will be redesigned post COVID? Which I, I know we've already seen some uh, white papers on. Or what, what exactly? I think so. The, yeah, there's a, yeah, I've been trying to, like, I'm sure a lot of you are trying to uh, consume all the information out there. I was just, uh, I subscribed to the Boston Business Journal, and uh, the last two editions have some interesting articles. There were some um, uh, interviews with CEOs of a, of a cross-section of Boston area businesses that did comment on that. And there's also a chart, there's a graph in there that shows uh, surveys of employees on how many prefer to work home, and how many don't. 
but more importantly is the chart that really talks about what the CEOs think is going to happen. And interesting that I think it was 36% of those reported that they feel that 75 to 100% of their employees will permanently work at home. That's a lot. Yeah. If you have something like a third even of uh, businesses whose employees will permanently work at home, that completely changes the office environment. Now, I will say that the, uh, the, um, the owner of the building where our, our offices are located, I met with them and they're, they're not sure either what's going to happen. They're one of the largest uh, office building owners in the state. And um, they feel on one hand, there will be uh, companies who do downsize. Uh, their lease is going to expire and they may not renew it or they'll renew to smaller space, but they also could end up needing more space. So if you're our particular office, I've looked at it and we have pretty big offices, so we don't have a problem with six foot separation in our office right now, but many offices do. So if you're then going to maintain that kind of space, you're going to need a lot more office space than you did before. So if you are, so if half your employees come back, you might still end up needing more space per employee than you did before. So this will vary based on the business where you are, but I, I do think that uh, both things will be happening, mm -hmm. and I do, do think that offices will be reconfigured, and I also think that for very large um, uh, population centers where, where companies have a lot of employees in one place, we may see them, them uh, uh, creating distributed offices out in the suburbs, so that people don't have to commute. And, yeah, that was but one. They of the still first. have a place to to sit if they do need to come to an office. Yeah, I was going to say that was one of the questions: is if you see a a city center moving to the you know more rural areas. It could be. I think there's opportunities all over. As I pointed out, I just used an, the example of Assembly Row, yeah. but I think the whole Seaport area is isn't that a mixed use? There's everything there. There are businesses there, there's apartments, there are condominiums, there's retail, and it's right there. So, so if you happen to be living there and working there, then you have that future and you're, you're not going to be getting, you might be getting an Uber or Lyft uh, and maybe someday you'll be uh, comfortable in, because it's an individual ride. You're not in with a lot of people on a subway, for instance. So I think you'll see more of that. Um, I mean, I lived on Beacon Hill for a while. I think of that almost being the same thing but more tilted towards residential, but it was mixed use still. So wherever we have mixed use, I think there'll be sort of a locus there. But since if you have a lot of employees, you know, those employees are going to be spread out, not just in Boston, but out in the suburbs too. So I do see um, some companies may, may put offices around the Boston area, whereas maybe they didn't before. I, I do know one client I've had in my business consulting days, who just didn't feel that they that it would be cost effective to have an office on the other side of Boston. They were south of Boston. So would they would it be cost effective to have an office on the north side? They felt no. Now, if I were to call them up right now, they'd probably say, absolutely, it's yeah, we, we don't have a problem with that now because we've learned that we can be productive at home. I know that uh, Meridian's employees, I did an employee survey uh, about three weeks ago, and I asked them how productive they felt at home. And about 80% said that they felt perfectly pro productive at home. And then there was about 20% of them who said, you know, not, they're often not very productive. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then the reasons for it were all the personal reasons we have, ability to focus, kids, uh, other people in the household, uh, where you're located, not having a dedicated office space at home. Although most people said they did. But, but I think that's, uh, will vary based on the company, but, um, it, uh, I think reach out to your employees and ask those kind of questions uh, and uh, it'll be revealing the answers you get. Um, wh what kind of experts do you think we should be reaching out to to adopt new technologies and processes? Depends on your business. So um, I just um, went through some of the technologies in the built environment. I think in the built environment, engineering, architectural, and so on days uh, are, are areas. It's um, you know more three three dimensional uh, design, using that data, uh, using having firms that understand how to take that and do time simulations and cost simulations in mm -hmm. the in the three D design world. Uh, the time simulation is called four D, 
and the cost simulation is called 5D. So 5D design, what does that mean? It means you can plug and play different parts and components. Uh, I also would say in that environment, there was a large, maybe I won't mention it, but one of the largest uh, Boston area universities that expanded hugely across the river into Boston with a medical center. Um, that was 15 years ago and they were uh, on the leading edge and um, the company I was with at the time created that three-dimensional model for them right down to every single thing that was inside the laboratory. So you could essentially inventory your equipment and manage the facilities with that raw data. So I think it's the, the software platforms out there is being familiar with what's available out there, the software platforms. I think like ECL USA would be, uh, uh, and, the, and the firms and the individuals involved with that would be a good resource as well to find out. But it certainly is, um, all right, we talk about technology. Um, what I find is that the, the individual that understands the technology is just one part. Right. The other piece you need is the person understands its business application. Right. So, so that's a big difference is you, know, you hire an IT person uh, and I've seen even pretty big companies hire a director of IT strategy and they'll create a job description that's just very, you know, somebody that knows software platforms. And I'd say, well, that's great, but they really also need to understand how it fits with your business. That's a different skill set. So I would say you need, need individuals to understand a variety of technologies, but also someone to understand business and your business that can sort of match those technologies up with your business. Uh, understand the cultural changes we also talked about and help you create that vision and then to implement that vision. Yeah, one of the things that came to mind when you were discussing um, the internet of things is um, even as we evolve, as our technology evolves, um, there's more, we're at more risk, right? For cybersecurity. So if we, you know, start using a new software, any kind of technology, then we're, I mean, obviously larger uh, out, outfits are uh, more susceptible, but people yeah. forget that part, even with Zoom, you know? Right, that's right. And I mentioned just um, the, how to put the pieces together. This book that's uh, up in front of you right now is not a technology focused book. It is talk, talks briefly about how to develop the strategy, but it talks about implementation. And about 80% of the book is actually what you do before you even develop the strategy, which is to have a full commitment from the top of the company to, to get behind the implementation phase, to know it's gonna be a learning phase. Individuals will need to be supported in that phase. You'll have to be able to measure it. You'll have to, have to work through the trial and error of trying something new. And uh, so understanding how all that works to create alignment with your employees, with your customers, and how to implement it is, is really important. I think if you do the upfront work that really is described in this book in great deal, great detail, it'll help you then implement it and take those skills, I mentioned the technology skills, but the, the business skills, and put it together to, to then adapt yourself to that future. Interesting. I'm excited to read it. I can get on Amazon. It's a quick read. It's only about 90 pages. It's an audio book. It's oh, a Kindle as well as hard copy. So. Great. I like the audio <laughs> for long drives. People do, yeah. yeah. And it's not my voice, so you don't have to listen to me. <laughs> oh. I did a great job, though. <laughs> um, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions. Are there any right. final thoughts that you wanted to share with the attendees? Well, first of all, Anastasia and Sarah, I'd like to thank you so much for inviting me to participate today. It's been uh, a lot of fun. And yeah. uh, we'll, we'll be working together um, some more after this too. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, you'll be submitting an article, right, for July? I hope so. Awesome. Yeah. Don't worry, so. I'll be on you. I'll be like, no, 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 you need to. All right. And then <laughs> the last kind of thing is uh, with all the change and all the worriness about COVIDness and social is isolation, I get to leave this webinar and go to the airport. <laughs> Oh no, that's right. And when I come home, I already have been told that I'm going to isolate for five days. <laughs> so, uh, but it's necessary. I do some travel. So that's what's happening. Travel safe, everybody. Stay safe.
Thank you so much, Doug Reed of Meridian Associates. And uh, before we end, I just, and thank you uh, everybody for attending. Um, we, we are recording this. So if for whatever reason, somebody that signed up cannot, um, couldn't attend today, you can find this on our YouTube channel um, by next Monday. Um, next week, uh, June 4, we have Jennifer Luoni. Uh, Luoni, I think that's how you pronounce it. She's the director of operations at Dicon uh, Corporation, and she'll be talking about reducing invest investment risk in a post-pandemic world. Thank you so much, Doug. Again, I really appreciate it. And um, you're welcome. And I'm excited to to get the audiobook, actually. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, let me know what you think. I will. I will. And I love reviews too. If anybody does get it, okay. Love well, reviews. I, I, They're really hard to get, but I love them. You know. All right. I'll. All right. I'll thank do you. It. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.